tonight we're continuing in the fifth chapter of of uh, Ephesians <coughs> this will be our 70th lesson in this series we'll be in verses 25 through 27 Now the text is talking about wives and husbands, but then again it's not really talking about wives and husbands. In submitting to her husband, the wife is a depiction of the submission of the church to Christ. She's living she's a living testimonial to that so that when the church talks about Christ and the church to got this living example now Paul's going to focus on the husbands showing them how their love and devotion to the Lord is an intentional depiction of Christ's care for the love and care for the church it's a on purpose is to show the redeemed that in order for them to be saved it required a selfless redeemer who was willing to marry and care for those who were ordained to eternal life that this is no small thing that there really isn't anything on earth that fully depicts this God had to create a church <laughs> to even transmit this message. You could begin in the Garden of Eden, talk about husbands and wives, and go plumb to Christ, and you would never find a living example that declares what God wants declared. God wants the world to know more than they should be subjected to it, submitted to Him. That, they do need to be that, but he, there needs to be a lot more than that known. So that's what he's, he's opening up here to us. There's commandments delivered to husbands and wives and children. And those are not to be underestimated. We're not to, I mean, they're just not like parables. I mean, they're very real commandments. But they provide an intelligent and rational view of the relationships that instruct us about the nature of God. Amen. That's what these are about. These aren't about so you'll get real smart about men and women. <laughs> I mean you may be but so what? The purpose of this instruction isn't to make sure now your homes are all operating within the perimeter of God's commandments. Although they should be. But that's not what this is about. And he's going to tell you that before the chapter gets done. He's going to tell you that. Moses could have told us all that. He's telling us something more. There's something more than that here. See, it's salvation is targeted to do things that are outside the perimeter of human experience and man can't be any smarter than his experience yeah. his knowledge can't extend beyond the perimeter of his experience now, here's the thing about salvation it does extend beyond the perimeter of human experience yeah. it does do things that there isn't anything in all the world like it how's God going to teach this to people He's not going to work with what he's got, men and women. He's going to create men and women. Yeah. And he's going to invest in them and give them responsibilities that are designed to teach them about him and what it takes to save a person. Or more particularly to save a church. Salvation is of such a nature that if you do not understand it, you'll not be able 
but you'll not be able to be saved. Because understanding is a key part of salvation. Knowing is a key element in salvation. Salvation is more than just picking you out of a horrible pit and setting your feet in a solid rock and putting a new song in your mouth. It's more than that. You've been called into an area where you're going to be asked to do something with God and to be sent forth by God and to walk with Christ. And so he's... uh, if you're going to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, you've got to have some understanding about this. Amen. So that's what Paul is doing. He's giving us some of that. In salvation, there's a lot for men to do. And yet what they do is not the point. <laughs> Understand. It's a lot for them to do. By men, I mean mankind. There's a lot for the redeemed to do but what they do is really not the point. It's how they do it and why they do it. That's the point. Amen. And uh, to get your hower and your wire in good shape, yeah. he's going to expose you to what God's like. The fact is God is working in us both the will and do of his own good pleasure but he performs this work within the context of fellowship with him and with the Son. That's that's the caveat. <laughs> he doesn't do it like unconsciously. Yeah, and your unconsciousness. Just don't worry, it'll all just work out, it'll all just pan out. That's not how this thing works. It is all gonna pan out. But only if you're in the process. Yes. Only if you've been connected to the head. And there's something going on between the head and you. That's what he's expounding. Now he's assisting us, Paul in this text is assisting us in understanding this whole process. All right, here's a text, First Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. Husbands. Listen up now. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Now that's a big project, isn't it? Jesus didn't do these things so things should be nice in the world. You know, we have a better world to live in, a better place to live in. That's not what this is all about. You can, this world can be a hell to live in and you can still go happy to heaven. In fact, sometimes the worse it is in the world, the more joy you get. Because trouble kind of drives you out of yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty soon you're, you find, I'm not as smart as I thought I was. Because if I was, I wouldn't be having all this trouble. See, so if you've got a lot of trouble, that's right off the bat telling you that there's just, you've got the dumb factor. Yeah. Am I right? Uh-huh. If you were smart, you wouldn't get out. You wouldn't have all this. You'd be able to figure all this out. But this is teaching us something about ourselves. We do really need a Savior. Amen. Get out of the world. That's right. Yes, it does. That's right. <laughs> he teaches you can't control the world, can you? And yet he says we're kings and priests, so there's got there's got to be someplace else. Amen. You'll be glad to get the world out of us. Oh, amen. Now this is a proper commentary on the response of a godly husband to the submission of a godly wife. Now, at this point, we're not in the realm of law. You've got to really see this now. <laughs> I've studied and tried to ask the Lord to help me to say this, say what I see. We are not in the realm of law here. We're in the realm of divine purpose. And there's a big difference. Law is about you. 
purpose is about God. So now we're, we're walking about in the area of divine purpose. This isn't a should-do environment. Even though there's some should-dos for you, that's not the kind of environment we're in. The should-dos are all designed to teach you what God did. This is not, this matter of being saved is not an automatic process. And it's not a cold and heartless one either. And it's not governed by law, it's governed by grace. Husbands, listen up now, husbands, love your wives. What's he talking about? Really, very graciously, God has very graciously spelled out rather meticulously what he means when he says love. Yeah. I'll give you a little of it. Charity, that's love. That's profound love. Charity suffers long, and it, it endures a lot. And it is kind. Charity envies not. Charity vaunts not itself, pushes itself to the forefront, is not puffed up, like prideful, does not behave itself unseemly, unseemly, doesn't always have to say, I'm sorry. Sorry I did that. Doesn't seek his own, is not easily provoked, doesn't fly off the handle. Thinks no evil, always takes the best view of things. Yeah. There are people who take the worst view, the worst, let's see, what's the worst possible thing that could mean? That's, that's what they choose. Thinks no evil. Rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, it holds up, it holds up. Believes all things, even though it looks like it's impossible. Hopes all things, keeps the future clear. Endures all things, trials, stresses, tribulations. Well, charity never fails. That's the kind of love we're talking about here. Husbands, love your wives. That's it. I don't know anybody in Christ, no matter how long they've been in Christ, that to this day is not challenged by this text. Doesn't make any difference how long you've been there. This text will challenge you, but this is what love is. Not what it ain't, that's what it is. That's the kind of love we're talking about. So this is not confined to the emotional part. See, none of that was like emotional. You, you picked up on that, I know, but <laughs> all of it was rational, deliberate. The all of it was willingness. Amen. Well, there is emotion, but there's intellect and will too. The whole of man is involved in this. Now, at this point, I can only speak for myself. I suspect some others have had the same experience. If my wife comes short in some area, and I am quick to say, if she does, I don't know it. But if she did, it would be more owing to me than it was to her. That's the way it is. That's how this love thinks. I'm painfully aware, as I'm sure many of you are, of the harsh impact that unloving conduct has on a person. Husbands, am I I'm included? Let's make sure that that kind of thing doesn't come from us. Amen. Amen. I'm not perfect in yours. I'm not perfect in this, but I want to be. Amen. I want to be. I've made some determinations because of perusing this subject. Husbands, love your wives. 
That's just so you don't get lost. Even as Christ. <laughs> yeah. See, right away, take, poop, moves the spotlight off of you. See, as soon as the spotlight's on you, he, he leaves it on there long enough for you to do some examinations. Or, whoop, he switches it off, gets it off of you. Why? Because if the spotlight's on you pretty long, it'll wilt you. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it will. You're under the light of God, God just, it'll wilt you. You just wither down. Sometimes that that's necessary. That, but he doesn't want you to stay in that state. He sw switches it to Christ. Even as Christ also. Some other versions say just as, also, just as Christ did. Show the same kind of love and exactly as he did. Now at this point, let's, I want to be clear about this. Throughout history, the church has not done well in clarifying Christ's love for the church. This point has not been clarified. In fact, in all my lifetime, and in Christ, it's, it's been over 61 years, and in my preaching life, it's been since 1953, I have never heard an extended sermon or extended commentary on Christ's love for the church. That doesn't mean there hasn't been any. Just means in the circles I walked in, this is not what you talked about. You talked about love as always, you should love God, you should love Christ, and you should. But this has got to be established first. Christ loved not the world, not the world, that's not what it says, the church. Christ loved the church. Somehow the consideration has been shifted to John 3.16. I don't know how this happened, but the emphasis, the preaching emphasis has shifted to John 3.16, for God so loved the world. But there's only one time that's stated. Uh, right. Yeah. The rest is God loved us. Yeah. Christ loved us. What Christ, uh, Christ loved for the church, if this is not established in the hearts of men, they will fail in their Christian life. Yeah. Amen. This has got to be seen. Christ's love for the church. Paul does not admonish the husbands to love their wives as God loved the world. But you got to at least think about it. <laughs> but to love their wives as Christ loved the church. Now the apostle is bringing us, very subtly, I might add, He's bringing us to think about Christ. Even though it sounded like he was starting out wanting us to think about the family structure. Interesting, isn't it? And here we are in the middle of the discourse. Our minds have been focused on Christ and the church. Why? He knows that men tend to overlook how great Christ loved the church. If they do know about it, is to overlook it. In institutionalized religion, they could care less. They're interested in the fellow out there. While the flock of God is starving to become an initiated and dropping out. The love of Christ for the church has a powerful, compelling force to it. That if you can see it, there's no end to what it will, what it will do when you see it, whether you're a husband or a wife. Amen. Even as Christ also loved the church. Now the love of Christ is particularly identified with those who are in Christ Jesus, and this is pretty consistent through throughout Scripture. The Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's an inside view. Paul said that's an inside view. It's not an outside view. When Jesus appeared to Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus, he didn't say, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Is that what he said? 
He said, I'm the one you're persecuting. Right. That's what he said. Once in your once you're inside, that's another it's another matter. Jesus said, Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, I'll love him. That's John 14, 21. He also said, Greater man hath no man than this, that he lay out his life for his friends. Huh? Now, Christ died for his enemies too. But they, notice what he said here. Greater love is no man. This is the king talking here. Greater love is no man than this, that he lays down his life for his enemies. Is that what it says? But that's how it's preached. No, the greatest love is when he lays down his life for his friends. Christ's love is particularly associated with giving himself for us. Walk in love, the fifth, this fifth, same chapter, second verse. Walk in love as Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling Savior. Savior. When Jesus introduced himself to Paul and in John to John in Revelation 1 5, the word is said that he was the Christ who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. That's Christ loving the church we're talking about. He didn't wash the world from their sins. You don't understand that. He made provision. I understand he made provision for it, but we're talking about the washing itself. The washing itself only happens inside the church Amen. when you're added to the body of Christ. So here's a categorical statement we have here. Christ loved the church. It took and it took a special kind of love for that to happen. And he gave himself. For those who have been reconciled to God, they must associate the love of Christ with the church. This, this is God. Otherwise, you'll never, you ever go off first base. You've got to recognize this. You've got to recognize the love of Christ for the church. Not when they were sinners. His focus is here is that he died, gave himself as far as to his death. He did die when we were sinners. He did die when we were sinners. But that's not what he's talking about here. Listen, brethren. Being a sinner may qualify you for the death of Christ. But Jesus had something much more in mind than taking you out of sin. And forgiving your sin. He has a lot more in mind than that. Even that statement that Paul made there in Second Corinthians about well, we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Yeah. He said it to the church. That's right. Yeah. That was not some public proclamation in the streets of court. Amen. It oh. was said to the church. <laughs> uh, it seems simple, doesn't it, when you see it? But... Go ahead, Brother Jeremy. Yeah. And, and also, whenever uh, people say um, John 3 16, it's interesting how they put the brakes on right there and they can't make it to John 3 19. That you're condemned if you if you love darkness and the light has condemned yes, you. Amen. Already. It's the light has condemned you. See with the with the darkness and with the world. No. That was sin. You remember when Paul would call the elders of Ephesus to Miletus? And he said, Now listen, he said, feed the flock of God, feed the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. There it is. That's the love or he loved us, see? Amen. He bought the church. He bought the church with his own blood. That's the kind of love now we're talking about here. Gave himself for it. He died for the sins of the world, but he only bought the church. That's right. By the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a big difference between provision and experience. So we talk about provision. Now both of these were covered. Jesus made a full provision for all sinners. But the experience is where the love factor comes in. Now why did Jesus give himself? Now remember, he 
He said, husbands love your wives even as, and then he just he forgets about the husband I saw. Because <laughs> he's got your attention. He knows, he knows. If I can get the attention of the people on Jesus, they'll listen better. Now let's see how I do this. Well, I, I will talk about their husbands and wives. That'll get their attention. Mm -hmm. Then when I got their attention, I'll put it in a second. <laughs> yeah, those I had four shifts, you know what I'm talking about there. <laughs> now, why did Jesus love the church? That in order that. Remember these long bit, we talked quite a bit about these long sentences in Scripture. He did this, that, they did that, that, did that, in order that. Here we are. This is why he did. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That's why he loved the church and gave himself for it. That matter's not often declared, is it? An unholy church needs to hear something like this. This is why he did. This is why Jesus gave himself for the church. He had a work he wanted to do right. in that church. See, divine love is often represented as an end of itself. God loves you, Christ loves you, and then it kind of just kind of stops. Yeah. No, there's a purpose purpose for it that he might now this objective he didn't love us so we might right? he loved us so he might <laughs> now I say that the he might ought to overshadow the we might they're not going to eliminate the we might that we might not going to eliminate it we're going to over you're going to have to do the we might in the context of he might. Yeah. That he might. Jesus loved and gave him himself for the church because something had to be done in order to get them to heaven. And quite candidly, he couldn't do it if he didn't, didn't love them. And they really weren't too lovable at the time. That he might sanctify. That he might sanctify. See, the church couldn't be sanctified until Jesus gave himself or died for our sins. Some other versions say in place of sanctify, make her holy, that he might make her holy or set her apart for God or consecrate her or dedicate the church of God or make the church whole or complete. All of that's involved in sanctification. Academically, the word sanctify means to render or acknowledge or be venerable to hallow. That is, it makes a person something God wants. Jesus did something to the church that made the church attractive to him and desirable to him. Something he could work with. It means to separate, sanctify, means to separate from the profane and dedicate to God. Move it from one location to another from serving the devil to serving God being dead to being alive being someone he couldn't work in someone he could work in and through sanctify now through the law God taught people about sanctify what it meant to be sanctified he taught them about it because it's, it's a different concept the world doesn't know about this see now the people himself he didn't he talked about the priests. They were the ones that were sanctified. The priests. Sanctify the priests. To me, that is, they're the ones that are going to deal with me. The people aren't going to deal with me. See, people couldn't, like, lift up a prayer in their tent. This, is, this isn't the kind of economy they had. When God said, if my people that are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, you know, I'll hear from heaven. Under their economy, they had to go to the priest or to a prophet to do that. They just didn't do it themselves because they didn't have access to God. They weren't even allowed in the outer court of the tabernacle. They couldn't even walk inside the outer court. It was only the priests. 
teach them what sanctify means. They had to wear special clothes, they had to do special things, they had to do it meticulously, they could not do their own will. Sanctified. Now in order for the church to have Christ's fullness poured into it, the church is the fullness of him that fills all in all. That is to say the church is like a vessel into which Jesus pours his traits and his attributes and his work. It had to be a clean vessel. It had to be sanctified. Something suitable for God to dwell in, so to speak. Now this happened, there's two senses of sanctification. One is an act that takes place independent of what you did. And the second is sanctified, it involves what you do. Right, now this sanctified is independent of what you did. This is something Jesus did. Amen. Yeah, it's not what you did. And the scriptures talk about it. Hebrews 10.10 10 says, We are sancti we are, san are, not can be, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all, all time, all people. That's the sanctification we're talking about here. Here it is again, Hebrews 10.14. By one offering, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. So that's either... He moved them into a, another arena, which was technically speaking his son. He moved the people over now where he, where he could work, where he can work with them. God's got to get you where he can work with you. That's not something you do. That's something he does. Amen. Christ had to love the church and give himself for that he might sanctify it. Yeah. Take it out of the world and put it over here. We can work with it. In order for the church to have this kind of benefit, you had to be in new surroundings, and only Christ could do that. Sanctify, set it apart, and cleanse it. The cleansing, if you get in this, clean, you had to cleanse it. You had to sanctify it so he could cleanse it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Am I right? Yeah. Ooh, this is good. This is why when a person's coming to Christ and some things that had to happen before you come. You have to save yourself from this untoward generation. You gotta do it. You gotta quit sinning outwardly. Yeah. Well, we can't do that until you come to Christ. Hogwash. John the Baptist said they had to do it before he baptized them. Amen. As if you were a drunk, you gotta quit being a drunk before you come. Yeah. Then Christ will strengthen you to keep keep that status. <laughs> you can see that, can't you? That, what do you think? Bring forth fruits, meat for repentance. What do you think that means? That means, come on, you guys, I only way I know you're serious is by your conduct. That's the only way I know. It's the only way John the Baptist do, by the conduct. But I see people whose conduct just continues to be gutter type conduct. They're not serious. It doesn't make any difference what they say. Yeah, right. They haven't been sanctified. The death of Christ, once it dawns upon a soul, from the experience or point of view, the person becomes resolved. I'm not staying here. Amen. I'm going there. Yeah. But back behind the scenes is Jesus taking them from here to there. See? Yeah. He loved him and gave himself for us that he could do that so he could take us, get us over here into the workshop. Yeah. Where the real work is being done. Oh, it's glorious. Uh, the Lord states there in his prayer, you all remember this, sanctify them through thy truth, yeah. thy word is truth, and for their sakes I sanctify, sanctify myself, myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Being cleansed is to the soul what healing was to the body. Now when an impotent man was healed, he wasn't impotent anymore. 
If he drug his right leg, he didn't drag it anymore. If he had a withered arm, the Lord healed his arm, it wasn't withered anymore. An impotent man hadn't walked his entire life, he had never walked. He just said, um, would you like to be made whole? Well, uh, he was at the pool of Bethesda that had five porches that were full of sick people, and he is the only person Jesus asked that to. Would you like to be made whole? Good question to ask people. Would you like? Would you like to not be a sinner? Can't we kind of, kind of clear the road and make sure we're dealing with the right people, right? Yeah. Amen. The person says, yes, I would. Well, all right, I got the answer. You like to be whole? He said, yes. He said, pick up your bed. I've been laying on this bed his whole life, 38 years. Pick up your bed, carry it, and go home. So the man said, "Let me you just give me a minute till I get my bearings. I'll give it a try." All right? Let me go. Let me pray about this. And tomorrow morning, I'll try and do it. You think he got up? He got up. At the point he exerted his will and exerted his strength to get up, and there was nothing he had an experience that would confirm he could do this. He just hanging on this word that Jesus said. Jesus said, pick up my bed and walk. So I don't have to, he didn't say get up and then lean down and pick up your bed. Pick up your bed and then get up. I see that would be a little bit harder. <laughs> Alright, being cleansed is like that. He cleanses us from all sin. That means the sin that once dominated you doesn't dominate you anymore. He is faithful to forgive us our sins. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse. That's what we're talking about here. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So that he loses his dominion and power over the person. Now, by the washing of water by the word. All right, now that's a difficult phrase, isn't it? What exactly does that mean? And some versions say the cleansing of God's word. Technically that's right, but I want to expound a little more. Using water with spoken words. It's God's word. That, that's actually not bad. Here God's word, the scriptures... That's not what he's talking about. This is a spoken word. At the point you obeyed the doctrine, the form of the doctrine that was delivered unto you, you were clean because the Lord said, now you're clean. The word is Jesus' pronouncement go thy way and sin no more. That's the word he's talking about. He can cleanse them. He got them in a situation where he could cleanse them with a word. Just like pick up your bed and walk. You see? I'm sure you can see that, but it's quite a truth to see, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. You hear him speak, you got to respond right then. That's right. That, uh, when your conscience doesn't condemn you anymore, the answer of a good conscience, you're baptized, you have this answer of a good conscience toward God. That's, that's your response. But the thing that caused the response was Jesus saying, you're clean. See? <laughs> now he gave himself for the church that he might sanctify it, put it over here into the work area, and cleanse it it had to be clean before it's used. Yeah. It has to be clean before it's used. And cleanse it by the washing of water. It technically started at your baptism. See? Yeah. But it was by his word that it happened. Alright, that's, that's one that. He gave himself for the church in order that he might sanctify and cleanse it. 
to wash the water by the word. But there's another that. In order that he might present it to himself. A glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. That's a second objective statement in our text. He did this in order that he could do that. He's saying he gave himself for you so he could sanctify and cleanse you. And he sanctified and cleansed you so he could present you to himself as his bride. Oh, what a... Now there's an overriding theme throughout scripture that refers to a presentation. A coming presentation. And Paul talked about it several places. He said he talked about being presented. He said, I, I want to present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And he said that he, he he wanted to present every man perfect in Christ. To the Colossians he said, Jesus died to present you holy and unbelievable and unreprovable in his sight. So see, so what's going on in this world really isn't the main thing. Yeah. Even if it's what God's doing in the world now. It's preparatory. It's not, it, the main thing hasn't come yet. Uh -huh. It's going to come though. In Jesus' ministry, he's getting ready for what's coming. Amen. See, people are trying to get people ready for what is in the world. Answer their problems, adapt to their problems. So forth. Oh, that's not why Jesus is working. He wants to present the church to himself a glorious church. Now, what's a glorious church? What is a glorious church? Well, yes, it's a splendor and glowing, yes. A glorious church is a church that has all the stuff that hid it stripped away and it's, you see the church as it really is. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but when he shall appear, then shall we also appear. That's a glorious church. See, glory is what you can see of the thing. The glory of the sun is what, is what you see. The glory of the moon is just what you see. See, what you see of it is its glory. Prior to Christ, there was very little, there was little glory of God seen. See, there was, because he hadn't revealed much. Now in Christ, he's revealed a lot, so there's a lot of glory being revealed. But unless you tell people that you're in Christ, very few people will, will conclude that. Because you don't look like it. <laughs> we don't look like our sins are remitted. We don't look like we're accepted in the beloved. But when the glorious church is going to look like that, that's what glorious church means. Now Jesus, when he was on earth, his body hid him. In fact, it's called the veil in Hebrews. He entered through heaven through the, through the veil, that is to say his flesh. So his flesh concealed who he was. Your flesh conceals who you are. Remember when Jesus was transfigured? Now he had the glory, he had the glory. It was, you might say, inside. But the glory like pushed out. Remember? His skin of his face showed, his clothes were white and glistering. It was what he was, really was, was coming out. It was blinding. Well, now Jesus, he's in a glorified body. So anybody that's ever seen Jesus since he died and went to heaven saw him glorified. It was a bright, <laughs> it was any disguise. There's no more disguises. Or the church, with the, the glorious church, is a church, no, no disguises. Nothing to lead you to any other conclusion but that this is the Lamb's wife. Amen. Going to be really clear. A glorious church is one that's been changed by stages while it's here. 
because see, this is what we're this is what's coming this is what we're headed for so now we are changed from glory to glory even by the spirit of our God that's 2 Corinthians 3.18 that's so when this body is discarded something's left that shines now people that are lost it'd be nothing that shines there'd be no glory see no splendor so a glorious church as I'm working with it so when it drops the body it's already been detached from it Amen. it's already crucified the flesh so now it just shines forth like it really Amen. is because I'm not going to marry an unglorious bride Amen. she's going to make herself ready and have her wedding garments on it's going to look just like the person just like the bride I want when you look at it that's what you're going to see because she's prepared for that hour. See, right now we have the treasure in earthen vessels. So, if you want to know what someone knows, like you got to ask them, what do you know about this? If you want to inquire about their understanding about the kingdom, you got to ask them about it. Because the vessel's hiding it, see. Amen. Good, Jerry. Anyway, you say that... It it kind of makes it silly that people spend their whole life trying to make the flesh beautiful and right. money and time and effort. That's right. In the end, it's going to just be tossed aside. But they've spent all this time. Amen. Instead of spending time preparing themselves for this new glorified body. A glorious church. Be the, 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 the most uh, humiliating thing that right in the midst of the devil's territory, God extracted a people that they, they, they were sanctified and cleansed and kept in this environment, in the, world, yeah. in the midst of it. And there wasn't anything he could do about it. And there wasn't anything he could do that would ultimately turn them away from this. Jesus said, all that the Father has given me will come to me. Right. So this, this, is, this is right in his face, as it were, yeah, is that you want to defy God? Look what God can do. Their frustration of sin. Yep. Okay, that he might present it to himself a glorious church. Now, no one that doesn't want this will get it. This isn't going to be handed out to people who don't want it. That's why we stir one another up. That's why we provoke one another to love and good works. That's why we do this, because you've got to be ready for this. Because you are going to drop this mortal coil someday. It's going to go. And what's left is what everybody's going to see. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's right now. I'm telling you the truth. Of the day of judgment. What's left after the body's gone. That's what the assembled universe is going to see. Amen. And it's going to be most pleasant for the bride. Yeah. Amen. And at that point, we're not going to be caring about anybody else. Yeah. Now we do. Now we have care for other people, but not then. It's all over. Yeah. It's all over when we're there. God's not even going to care for anybody else. It's the bride. Not having spot or a stain or a mark. A speck, like a speck in your eye. <laughs> a speck. A spot is a moral blemish fault a spot to the inner person is like a spot of leprosy was to the outer person the priest if they suspected someone had leprosy they'd examine them now, there's a whole elaborate procedure about examining to see if about the if the skin hit was so a certain way they'd keep a track of it see if it went away or it enlarged if it went away then there was a ceremony that he was been cleansed but that spot that that tipped him off uh, that, that person's got leprosy no spot no sign of weakness no no guilt no sin it's a glorious church it's going to be without spot Peter said and blameless and blame see this is what this is why Jesus gave himself now Jesus gave himself for the church so he could sanctify it cleanse it and present it to himself a glorious church so if the church is not
glorious. <laughs> Jesus said, you were ashamed of me? Huh? I'll be ashamed of you. Jesus said, well, I never, Father, I never knew these people. They're not with me. And this is going to happen. This is for real. But for all those who fought the good fight and finished the course and kept the faith, he's going to say, there, Father, there with me. The rest of the people say, yeah, we can see their glory. They're shining. Not having a spot. No spot. Or wrinkle. <laughs> wrinkle? Yeah, it means wrinkle. That's exactly what it means. Wink, wrinkle. The word literally means uh, fold or draw together, wrinkle, what Mars, pucker the face. <laughs> I like what the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia said. No wrinkle was indicative of the perennial youth and attractiveness of the church. I thought that that's beautiful. That just said there'll be nothing about it that like is on the decline. There'll be nothing about it that will th you'll think old, uh -huh. decrepit, close to death. <laughs> be nothing, no wrinkle. Not even one. Not even one wrinkle. None at all. There got that we won't have any law of sin in my members. See that won't. That's a wrinkle. It's not. It's not something you committed. It's. It's a wrinkle. I find another law in my members. Born against the law of my mind. That's a wrinkle. But when the bride is standing before the Lord, <laughs> he's presenting her to himself, which is an arresting thought itself. Not even one wrinkle won't be there. Or any such thing as anything related to it. Like having to mortify my members that are upon the earth. Or anything that has to do with deficiency, decline, deadness, anything like that, not going to be there. Jesus has gave himself for the church so that ultimately he might do this, but that it should be holy. Remember he died sanctified. Now, now, the, now the sanctification that put him in the work area, now has been completed. The work's done now, and the Lord cut it short in righteousness. And a church is holy and without blemish. You look at it as if they don't have a vile body. We did here. There'll be no imaginations to cast down. Huh? There are here. No members to be mortified. There are here. The spirit will not be required to intercede for us and lead us in mortifying the deeds of the body. See? without blame. No blemish. There'll be nothing unpleasant. We'll be all together beautiful. Amen. Yeah. All together beautiful. Yes. That's right. That's right. Well said. Be all left behind, won't it? <laughs> Very good. That's why Jesus did what he did. To present us a glorious church to himself. Now he's preparing the unseen part, our spirit, to be able to make the transition to the resurrection body and the new heaven and the new earth. He didn't bring us out of this world imprison us again is to set us on a throne. Set us on a throne. Now husbands, you tell me that you can ponder or dwell upon this kind of love that Jesus had and not love your wives in an evident way. You couldn't. Love of Christ constrains us. Tell me, 
how the church will be able to effectively announce the gracious intentions of the Lord if its members are not subject to one another. Yeah, the church has got to get into the sanctuary of God like Asaph did. <laughs> and that's exactly what Paul did. He started out with what sounded like the obligations of husbands and wives and he ended up setting us in the sanctuary of God. He caught us. <laughs> By wisdom. <Yeah>. Who? <laughs> What marvelous wisdom. When you got through reading this fifth chapter, what were you really thinking about? He saw to it you were thinking about Christ and the church. So what did he do? He took us by the hand. He started lisping to us about husbands and wives. And as we're talking, we're making some progress over here. And all of a sudden, boom, we're over here talking about Christ and the church and glory. And that consideration is what will make you godly. Yeah. Well, the whole thing of wisdom is, is just staggering. I, I'm still kind of reeling over it how, <laughs> how wise Paul was. I was just brilliant. Yeah. But once you see it, it's really plain, isn't it? Yeah. You can see this, that this is what he was aiming at. He was aiming at you seeing Christ and the church because he knows you're not apt to sell all if you don't see this. Be because that's what Jesus did. He sold all. Mm -hmm. yeah. He abandoned self-interest. Yeah. Once you see that, I mean, he had a lot of interest to abandon. You don't have that many. Not compared to him. Right. Not compared to him. So what did I say to one, I say to all, you can do it. Amen. <laughs> Oh man, well I let it go there, but that oh, that it just thrilled my soul yeah. to see this. Amen. God give us wisdom to be able to witness like this. Yes. Testify like this. You may start one place, but that's not where you end. Yeah. That's not where you end. You gotta end up some people you gotta lead them now, you gotta lead them into the sanctuary of God. They don't know how to get in there. Yeah. Right. Kind of like when Jesus sat by the well and said, Give me a drink of water. <laughs> that's exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Amen. Paul was a wise master builder, oh, okay. so he knew from the very beginning he knew what the project was going to end up. Mm -hmm. That's the difference between a, wise, a master Amen. builder and, a, and an apprentice. Yeah. The apprentice doesn't. He can't see what it's what it's going to be. Yeah. The, the wise master builder see all every step in the process. <laughs> All the details make sense to the master builder yeah. because he has the vision of the, that's right. of the end. Yeah. And that's why Paul was able to negotiate all of these issues that he uh, addressed mm -hmm. to the different churches and the individuals and, and all the letters because as a master builder, he could see how they all fit in mm -hmm. or how they didn't fit in, and he uh, addressed them appropriately. Amen. Amen. Yes, Sister Henny? Um, I was considering when you said that a spot in um, because of the reasoning that leprosy was highly contagious, whenever a man, whenever they found out that a man had it, he was to be sent away so that it wouldn't spread to anybody else. I was considering that in the body, if a man is found with leprosy, he must be sent away. Mm -hmm. That's right. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I was thinking when you were speaking of sanctification, the actual work of sanctifying is beyond us. That's we, right. we were the unclean ones, and if we tried to cleanse ourselves, it would have been a futile effort. God won't sanctify us if we don't want to be clean. Mm -hmm. And in that, and yes. in that, in that way, mm -hmm. we won't be sanctified. Mm -hmm. it, when we submit to the working of God, when you actually want to be sanctified, the work is beyond us. Very and good. Yeah. We, we, as I said, we're the unclean ones. You. If you're dirty, you can't clean something else very well because uncleanliness is contagious. It it it, it spreads very easily. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bird. I was thinking along the same lines as Brother Aaron here that the the whole eternal purpose of, of God being so wise and masterfully planned.
plan because he did he knew what he desired to bring about. So in order in order for that to come about, he had to purpose and make provision for mm -hmm. every step in between yes, right. to lead mm -hmm. to that end. Yeah, amen. And on the on the reverse side of this coin, I was thinking about man and and the effects of a lot of our generation not even considering what one action or word is going to produce. Mm -hmm. But here we see a whole string of things that the Lord did in order that to bring mm -hmm. this to pass. In order that he could do this Amen. and bring this to yeah. pass in the end. Yes. Amen. Yes, Brother Robert. Yeah, it was good to see again that baptism is a multi-dimensional event. Amen. That, see, there's things here that, that have to be done. They have to be done right. I mean, as the person, you know, the, the, this is a serious matter we're going through. And so there's are led through this procedure, and yet that, the procedure itself, isn't what's baptizing them into Christ. That's right. And so you have Christ, uh, he's judging the thoughts and the intents of the hearts, the motive, why the person's entering yeah, into this, yeah. what's going on. But all that's unseen, but it's still happening all at the same time. Yeah, same but I don't, I don't think that that dimension has ever adequately been defined to the people being baptized. Oh, no, that this is just we're gonna dunk you and, and then you're in no matter what. But see this yeah. this this is much more some things more profound than we can see are going on yeah. and it's Christ's work in the baptism that makes it effectual. Amen. amen. The operation of God. I amen. Yes. He does say that as many as are baptized in Christ and clothe themselves in Christ they're neither Jew nor free, uh -huh. slave nor free, male nor female. That's why these words yeah. then yeah. Yeah. ultimately yeah. point to Christ in Amen. the church, not the husband and the wife. Yeah. That's right. Uh -huh. Amen. Yeah. Sister Mariah. Uh, Come on, right? In the end, there will be any question as to who the bride of Christ is. And the bride of Christ Amen. <laughs> No question about who the bride of Christ is. Yeah. That's, what, that's the glory. See, yeah. that's, that's what the glorious is. Yeah. The glory is what will distinguish the bride, see? Yeah. <laughs> it's also what distinguishes God and Christ. Yeah. I was just thinking, too, about this um, presenting of the bride to himself without spot or wrinkle. It's just a glorious thing that the Lord allowed us to be able to <laughs> um, participate in this and be able to see it together and, and this submitting to one another, if we're not, if the church doesn't do this, it won't be able to be presented without That's spot right. or wrinkle. But we will be presented that way. The church will be presented. But the submission is part of, of, of this preparation. Preparation. Work. That's exactly mm -hmm. right. She has made herself ready. You know, there's nothing that God has, has called upon us to do that we cannot do by faith. That's right. And that's what this is about. Amen. We spoke about Christ. When you can make the parallel between these ordinary things like, like this, like marriage, mm -hmm. and the church, see, then you're now your faith is engaged. And you talked mm -hmm. about the why at the beginning. Yeah, that's it. He's going to get glory from why we do things. Well, here's an example of something ordinary that becomes extraordinary because of extraordinary reasons. That's right. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. I'll show you what I happened in the religious world. It's like a vice that's been placed on people's mind, but they can't think. Now maybe what we talked about tonight you've known for a long time. I don't think so. The length of time it took for this to dawn on my soul is a testimony to the blighting effects of form without power. You had to you had to put a lot of stuff behind you to see that when you finally saw it, you think, why goodness, why didn't I see this? Well, because we were in a kind of a dark place. We weren't in the sanctuary, see? The purpose, if you want to talk about evangelism or whatever, the purpose is to get people in the sanctuary. It's not just to get them baptized. To get them into the sanctuary where some work can be done on them. See, unless you know this, I was bathed, you know, in another kind of emphasis. Yeah. This one, the light that's on the church, is that in a lot of places, if you taught this in a lot of places, the reaction of people would be, well, what does that have to do with us? Or what does that mean to us anyway? We, we don't get the point. Yeah. That's what we, many in the church would, yeah. just, would say that. Like the bride saying to the person bride, making the wedding gown, what's that got to do with my marriage? Yeah. Anyone else? 
again. I was considering how when you're going to the fact that it's a glorious church on the, the glory that's going to be seen, how she is worthy to be his bride. Mm -hmm. Yes. Amen. 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 Yeah, the glory, see, will, will confirm the worthiness. Because the inhibiting, what inhibited her, will be removed. So now our job now is, while we got this inhibiting factor, which roots in our bodies, is to learn how to control it and deny its lust and so forth and get ready for this time so when we drop the body, it will be a relief. Amen. <laughs> Good riddance. <laughs> yes, yeah, Sister Jewett. We have kind of a vague uh, picture of this in the very beginning, whenever God caused all of the, the uh, real creation to stand, uh, pass before Adam, and there wasn't any uh, no meat for him. Very good. So the bride, and God made a bride. Amen. By, by, and he's making a bride for his son. Amen. Of course, he's involved in It's still, it's of him. Yeah. It isn't just a creature separate from him. Yeah. It's literally of him, just as Eve was of Adam. That's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this, yeah, this bride of Christ is not like the best of many he could select. She is the only one that is fit. Yeah. yeah, when we read, we have been created in Christ Jesus. Thank Eve. Yes, yes, yes. Huh? What do you think? Created, thank Eve. Because mm -hmm. it said we. Yeah. She was created from Adam. We were created from Christ. We are bone of his bone mm -hmm. and flesh yeah. of his flesh. Amen. That's what it says in this very chapter. Oh, that's marvelous, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, and all this, I know you didn't miss this, but. God intentionally created Adam and Eve so that we could have this have this uh, perspective because there was no other way to really understand it and then then when you, you feel like you're just on at the borders you know oh yes all he can show you is what you're able to receive. And this, your ability quotient is reduced considerably by this frail vessel. But when it's, <laughs> when it's removed, I just, uh, I've spent uh, yeah, a little over 60 years pouring the Word of God into my mind. So I, so I actually think in Bible. I, my thoughts are in Bible. As some people say, you just say who instead of that. You don't think like this. I, say, I'm just, I just talk like the, the Bible. Now the thought occurred to me the other day. What about when the time comes when all this, all of a sudden it all, it all, it all falls together. I, I can't even imagine. You sit all the time to see for maybe up to 25, 30 years the word of God that Moses and the prophets poured into his mind, poured into his mind. When Jesus appeared to him, all of a sudden, it all fell together. Amen. Peter on Pentecost. Peter on Pentecost. All, yeah, yeah. all, fell, all together. fell together. You just imagine that now. You give yourself now to feeding on the word of God. Just look forward to the time when all of a sudden, now you'll have a remembrance here or there. You're able to put several few things together and it thrills your soul. Just think when all of a sudden it all just yeah. flows together. And you see it. And, and that, that'll be glory, see? Amen. Glory will yeah. shine from that. Anyone else? All right. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're very grateful for the care you have for the church and for the care Jesus has exhibited for it to give himself forward and make provisions for us to be separate and clean, holy and without blame. We consent to this arrangement. And we ask for grace to complete our journey in a comely manner that will bring forth praise to you. In Jesus' name, amen.